The real estate industry is the world's single largest contributor to climate change. At Fifth Wall, we're on a mission to help the industry eradicate its carbon emissions and build to zero. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for joining. Where are you coming in from today? I'm in Burlingame, California. Thanks for having me. Nice. Um, well, I'd love to talk just about your background and your kind of professional passion around sustainability and sustainability-driven investing. Um, can you just walk us through kind of your career arc and how you came to focus on this? Sure. Um, I'll keep it pretty tight. I started as an entrepreneur in the late 90s in the internet 1.0 realm in a early incarnation of what is probably like known to most people as a Shopify type business today called Big Step, which was venture backed based in San Francisco. And it was really that early first wave of internet entrepreneurs. I remember going up and down Sand Hill Road and having people tell me that even though that Amazon thing looked interesting, no one was ever going to put their credit cards on the internet. Right. So, I mean, literally the best venture folks in the world. And, and so we were early days there, um, sold that company in 2002. And I decided that I just wanted to direct my entrepreneurial talents towards something that married profit and purpose. And it was early days in renewables. But when I looked at the numbers of cost curves of solar and wind and other things, I just it reminded me a lot of broadband and internet access in the late 90s. It just looked similar. Like, hey, when these things hit certain curves and they intersect, suddenly, like, it's a binary switch. Everything changes. And, um, I mean, climate change was like a, a thermostat setting then. You know, it wasn't a thing. Al Gore's movie hadn't come out. I actually was, I think I was early in the audience filming of Al Gore's movie. And just no one could believe anything that they were hearing at that point. And, and since no one believed in any of the internet stuff when I was doing that, you know, five years prior, I decided, oh, this is it. Like, of course. If, if then the no parallel one, was pretty obvious. Yeah, yes, yeah. So, so I jumped into solar as an entrepreneur, actually in Los Angeles uh, at Idea Lab with Bill Gross um, at a company called Energy Innovations, which we started to help bring down the cost of solar and uh, raise more venture money there. And built uh, a couple of different companies to help radically reduce the cost of solar and ultimately sold uh, my company to one of the global solar companies called SunTech. And there I, I joined the executive team and that company was a, a rocket ship at the global level. And I ended up running global sales and we, in my last year I sold three and a half billion dollars worth of solar, right? So we sold solar panels and it was a really interesting lesson in sort of globalization of trade and, and what made sense to make what where and how you think about global logistics uh, and building big sales organizations. So it was a lot of fun. Um, we built the largest solar company in the world and we reduced the cost of solar panels by about 90%. And it was interesting, it was just a good lesson because when I started that journey in 2002 or three, I just, I, I was very ambitious and, and sort of optimistic but I had no idea how we were going to get down that 90% cost curve. And I actually, at, you know, in darker moments, I would sort of figure out like, hey, if I don't know how this is going to get done, could it really happen? And it did. And then some, right? We actually took it down two orders of magnitude, you know, overall as an industry. So it was just a really encouraging lesson in what could happen. First, I did some digital stuff in the late 90s, but then to see it physically, what could happen in the real world. And, and that then led to um, a brief stint at NextEra Energy, which is one of the nation's now largest energy companies. And I built a distributed generation business there that's now a large part of that company. But a couple of years into that, uh, people I had known from the internet days and, and the co-founders of Obvious Ventures came to me and said, we're, we're getting the band back together. We've got this great team and we're missing this piece on the sustainable systems side of things, which for us really means mobility, energy, and building systems. And uh, why don't you come join us? And it, and it was one of those, you know, you offers you can't refuse. It was too perfect for what I had wanted to do from a mission standpoint, my whole career, at least that second part of the career. So about six years ago, uh, I joined up with Obvious right as our first fund was um, raised and haven't looked back. We now have 65 or 70 companies in the portfolio across three funds. And we've just been doing the same thing over and over again focusing on these three areas of sustainable systems, healthy living and people power. 
and usually going early in the series A kind of zone. And I focus mainly on sustainable systems, which has a lot to do with energy mobility and building systems, but also things like uh, supply chain. And increasingly, we're seeing a lot in the climate world in terms of direct climate mitigation uh, technologies. And you know, one of the questions we get asked a lot by real estate industry uh, professionals and just people that have um, I think been through a variety of hype, hype cycles around green tech and clean tech and now climate tech is why is this time different? Like what is fundamentally changed in the macro and microeconomics of sustainability investing? And then I guess as you think about answering that, I'd be curious to know in particular, how do you think that, that, that intersects with like the opportunities in the built environment, right? Which is where obviously we're focused. Yeah, look, I, I think that's a terrific question and um, something we should all ask ourselves on a regular basis when we're really being honest about it. And then, and then entrepreneurs as well, like what, what's different this time and what can we learn from history? Um, I, I, I didn't have a front row seat in it. I was on the stage in it last time and I went through some ups and downs on, on the you know, capital raising side and also the media attention and other things that were given to the space uh, called clean tech back then. And it was absolutely irrational at times. And it was absolutely an, an irrational exuberance that led to a lot of value destruction and unnecessary uh, capital pushes. So there's a couple of things I would say this time, you know, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about hype cycles and the hype, hype curve, you know, the Gartner hype curve, where you have this sort of early peak and then there's a massive drop and a trough and then reality sets in and everything comes out of that trough and goes into this long state of, um, of growth and development. And I think in clean tech, we could probably say that 2008 was a, a peak or 2006 to eight was a peak. And um, there was a trough of dissolutionment in the last five, six years. And, and now it's sort of climbing out of that or, or five, six years ago started climbing out of that. And now we're just seeing sort of climate tech be embedded into the way everything works. So Bird and Line were not pitched as climate tech companies. They're just electric scooter companies, right? They're, they're pretty interesting businesses. Uh, you know, Proterra was really pitched as a cleaner, better way to move citizens around uh, your cities. And now, of course, all the trucks and delivery and anything else that's decarbonizing a given economy is just pitched as a better way to a better way to build, better way to uh, move people around, and a better way to generate electrons. So there's something happening at the macro scale that's massive. It's driven mainly by the fact that solar is now more cost effective. Solar is probably more cost effective than wind in a lot of cases, which is pretty extraordinary. But they'll duke it out for a long time. So that that's driving some things. I think cultural awareness around climate is driving some things, but. Hopefully another piece is that we also learned some painful lessons about how to deploy capital during that last bubble and burst, I hope. And, and part of that would be, you don't need to use venture dollars to do infrastructure investing. We were pouring a lot of venture dollars into ethanol plants or large scale capital expenditures. That is not really necessary, it shouldn't be if you're doing something really transformational. Uh, so if you can find ways to finance all those scooters that you're going to deploy all over the world, there's probably cheaper capital to do that. And that might, you know, decisions like that and thoughtful ways to deploy capital might have a better impact on the way venture returns show up in this, in this new category. So there's a couple of things that I think are changing there. And then, sorry, in the building world, I think the, the other related piece is just regulation. Right. I mean, you, I'm sure you see it all the time, probably very involved with it. And, and that is going to drive more than a lot of other things. Uh, residentially, consumer choice will drive it. But commercially, I think, at least in the United States and Europe, we're going to see you know, we are seeing massive regulation drive behavior. But what's also so interesting is kind of some of the big capital markets drivers of this as well. I mean, real estate is fundamentally just a cost of capital business. It is driven almost entirely by access to and cost of capital and large capital allocators that allocate to the real estate industry traditionally have basically said, if you're not low or no carbon footprint real estate, we're just not allocating to you. And so it's kind of impacting cost of capital, but it's also coming, I think, increasingly so from the tenants themselves, um, you know, like from occupiers of space, like Amazon, right? Like, um, 
I guess one of the questions I have is, why do you think um, real estate had never historically occupied the spotlight in the climate debate? And instead, industries like transportation or heavy manufacturing or you know, natural resources uh, more obviously and kind of viscerally did to the average climate activist. Why was that? I mean, you look at a brick wall and you don't see, you might, and a lot of people watching this might see embedded carbon, but a lot of people don't, right? And when you look at a concrete slab or foundation, we might look at that and say, yeah, that, that was one of the reasons it's such an expensive part of a house is because of the embedded cost of the energy in those solutions. So uh, most people, I, I don't think, really see that. But in the Pareto chart of like, what should I worry about most uh, with regard to climate? You think of smokestacks, you might think of the food you eat, and you think a lot about transportation and, uh, and the energy that you consume. I think that's been, A, it's been lower hanging fruit. The substitution abilities are much faster. And B, it's been something that's been pretty actionable, right? Not everybody says, I'm gonna go build a new house, but anyone who does own a house might think, hey, maybe I can save some money if I put solar panels up on my roof. You brought up a really interesting point about, you know, how do you disambiguate the kind of opco R&D investing from the deployment investing? Because there's kind of this conundrum that real estate owners um, face where they say, well, I, I, I would deploy that technology if it were more cost effective, if the payback period were faster. I guess I'm curious, like if, if you were talking to a real estate CEO, what would you encourage them to start doing today? Like what kind of questions should they be asking themselves around their business that you think can just set themselves up well for this juggernaut spend of retrofitting that's imminent? Yeah. Um, it, it might depend a little bit too on the generation that I was talking to because right. uh, I have found across the board that uh, there are plenty of older generation, more senior season managers who care deeply about this subject, but every single young manager and developer and owner and somebody who's maybe taking over a family business, they all care deeply about it. So I think education levels are quite different depending on specifically who you're talking to, but I also think they've got a great opportunity to uh, get ahead. I mean, what I would talk about is getting ahead of the inevitable and what we know, I mean, what we know globally, what we've known forever is that with increasing average median wealth comes a greater and greater concern about the environment, about health, really. It's really about health, but it turns into a quick understanding of food and, and the environment. Yeah, and, and, and one of the kind of reflexive responses we do get from the real estate industry is also one of kind of complacency in how the real estate industry has always operated, which is I build buildings or I manage buildings I don't know about solar. I don't know about on-site batteries. I don't know about heat retentive glass and carbon sequestering concrete. How can I ever be expected to? Um, you know, one of the things that we've always struggled with is to get real estate owners to kind of reconceptualize what it is that they do. And I, you said it earlier in the conversation that sustainability is intersecting with industries in, in a way where it's not, it's not a sidebar. It's actually core to what you do. I guess, how have you seen that take place in other industries where sustainability has inculcated itself into the, the ethos and the operations of the industry in profound, uh, enduring, and I would say synergistic ways, right? Yeah. Like that, that actually makes the business better. It's a great question. I mean, I, you know, in a, in a related parallel, I'll just tell you, I remember Amazon in the early days. Amazon was called Amazon.com. And they knew they had to call themselves Amazon.com because people didn't know where the bookstore was. Like they literally, you know, like I need an address. So they told them, oh, it's, you know, they're signaling with the brand, it's a dot com. And then I think in like 2002 or 2001, they dropped the dot com because everybody knew by then, if you had a business, of course you had a dot com that was attached to it. But before that point, you really didn't. That was when the internet just became embedded in business. And we now see the same thing happening. I mean, you know, sustainability, like next era energy has never stood up on the mountaintop and said, look at us, we're a big renewables company. They just call themselves an energy company. I think we're seeing that play out over and over again, at least at the utility level. 
if that happens with the oil majors, we'll see. And I think it's going to happen. I mean, it clearly will happen with car companies where there won't be EVs and then Vs that will just be Vs. They just all happen to be you know, electric. And I think that that's going to happen with real estate too. I don't think somebody will say we're the best, you know, Durst is famously a terrific green builder, but related is, you know, more and more a green builder. Like, I think that will just happen more and more. It will just become an embedded part until that's all there is. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that we're starting to see that it's kind of the early innings of that where real estate companies are for the first time hiring real sustainability experts that are really scientific. I think what we saw kind of up until five years ago was a lot of decorative stuff. You know, yeah. I there's gardens on the roof or something like that, right? And these things that are largely in, inconsequential, but are kind of more marketing assets. And today, I think largely driven by regulation and capital markets, it's becoming more core. It's being intertwined into what it means to be a real estate company existentially, right? You are going to have to be a sustainable builder to be a builder of anything at all. Um, and that's a profound shift. Um, I totally agree. I think the dream is that, you know, my dream would be that Walmart and related and everybody doesn't have to have a chief sustainability officer. They just have a chief supply chain officer, you know, as they've always had, who happens to care deeply about and has sustainability metrics. You know, that's what Microsoft does. They've had an internal carbon tax forever. They just embed it into their business operations. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it feels like we're at a critical juncture right now, you know, with the incoming Biden administration re-entering the Paris Agreement. And in some ways, the, the U.S. real estate industry had a get out of jail free card in the last four years. Um, but I think now there's this great awakening happening. And frankly, it's really exciting because I think there's going to be a huge new market for all the technologies that you invest in. Um, that is the real estate industry, which I think is poised to become one of the biggest spenders on climate tech of any industry, which is so shocking, um, but also exciting. Cities and states have been carrying uh, the water big time for the last four years. But uh, I, you know, the, the great thing about the way the American system works, I think, is that a lot of those um, uh, decisions made around buildings and building systems and infrastructure are done very, very locally. So mm -hmm. I love the air cover that's going to take place from the Biden administration. That's terrific. But I'm also, you know, deeply grateful to great governors, red states, blue states, whatever, who recognize locally when it comes to health and when it comes to attracting businesses, they've got to build great anti-fragile resilient infrastructure and cities and buildings and those are always on the greener side and the power of local regulation you know it's like if you looked at the most anti-green at least politically state and you were to look at voting districts uh, you would probably see one blue dot over the capital city and if you were to say well where is real estate value in that state concentrated it's all concentrated in that one blue jurisdiction so there's kind of an inherent um, political dynamic to how sustainability is enforced at a local level and real estate is this industry where it's immovable definitionally right you can't move a building to a more favorable national jurisdiction with respect to sustainability so um, I think it's really exciting. And Andrew, this has been just a really enlightening conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and all the amazing work you've, you've done over your career. Right on. Thanks so much for having me, Brendan. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you.